I, I see that Courtney's online. I see uh, the, the Loyal's online, Donna from California. So if you're with us online and you can't make it today, you're on vacation or maybe you don't feel well, we're so glad you're with us. Everybody else here, it is great to see you today too. I believe God has a word for all of us. So I hope you're ready to receive. Before I get started, I wanted to, to show you, tell you what God showed me during worship. And I don't know who this is for, but what I saw was a, was a ship, and the ship was in the water, and the ship was being blown around. And I was reminded of Matthew when, when the disciples were in a boat, and they were, the storms were blowing around, and they actually they went and found Jesus. Remember, Jesus was asleep in the boat, chilling out, right? And uh, the, the disciples finally turned to him and woke him up. Don't you care about us, they said. And Jesus woke up, and he calmed the storm. You see, Jesus was in the boat. He was the anchor. They had to turn to Jesus. So I don't know who that's for, but what I saw was a boat in choppy water, and an anchor was being let out, and it was going to the ground, and that boat was going to be steadied. So if that's you, maybe you feel like you're being tossed around a little bit by some of the storms or cares of this world. Remember, turn to Jesus. He's with you. He's the anchor. Amen? Well, let's do this. Imagine that you play on a team, and before the big game happens, Jesus comes to you, and he tells you this. He says, listen, here's the deal. You're going to win no matter what, the score is this, and you're already, you, you are going to win. And I'm even going to show you the very last two minutes of the game so you can see step by step how it's going to happen. Imagine if you knew the score, what would it matter at halftime if your team's losing? Or if you mess up, does it really matter because you know you win in the end, amen? And that's what Jesus is telling us here in the end times. You see, Jesus, he's gone into the future, he has seen the future. And then he's come back to tell us what's going to happen in the future. So why do things matter to us as Christians sometimes too much? I'm not in denial, but I recognize sometimes I let, I let things matter too much in my life when they really don't matter because I know how the story ends. Amen? Last week we talked about how Jesus, where is he right now? The Bible says he went ahead of us to prepare a mansion that has many rooms. And he tells us what? He's going to gather us to himself. We talked about that as a period known as the rapture when Jesus gathers us to himself and then those that aren't gathered, that, that are not believers, they're going to have to go through a terrible time period called the tribulation, a seven-year period that we don't want to be going through, okay? And, uh, but just like the five virgins in the Bible, they had their, the lamp had full of oil, they were ready for the return of the bridegroom. God is telling us in this message, in this series, to be ready for his return Ready, ready. Here's some three concepts that we have to get. Let's check these out. Number one is the rapture when Jesus gathers us to be with him. The other one is tribulation. Those that are left on earth, they'll still have a time period to choose Jesus, but it's going to cost them a lot, probably their lives. And then we've got the Antichrist. That's the evil one that's put in place by Satan during the tribulation. All right? So this is week two as we continue to, to study scripture and what God says is coming, let's pray. Father, because you are God and creator of all things and everyone, and because of the accuracy of your word, would you awaken us to what is coming in Jesus' name? Amen. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Revelations 19. My mom's going to be happy right now. She's watching online because I'm using my Bible and not my Bible on my U version. She says, go old school sometimes. I said, okay, so mom, this is for you. Even though it's just as accurate on my iPad, just had to throw that in there for you. Mom, mom's going to get me later. All right, listen, here we go. Revelation 19, verse 11. I'm going to do some reading. Open your ears to what's happening. Then I saw, this is, or I will say this, here comes Jesus. Little, here we go, here comes Jesus. Then I saw heaven open, and a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. The armies of heaven, dressed in the finest of pure white linen, followed him on, a white, on white horses. And from his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God the Almighty, like juice flowing from a winepress, on his robe... At his thigh was written this title, King of all kings and Lord of all lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, shouting to the vultures flying high in the sky, Come, 
Gather together for the great banquet God has prepared. Come and eat the flesh of kings, generals, and strong warriors, of horses and their riders, and of all humanity, both free and slave, small and great. Then I saw the beasts and the kings of the world and their armies gathered together to fight against the one sitting on the horse and his army. And the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who did mighty miracles on behalf of the beast, miracles that deceived all who had accepted the mark of the beast and who worshipped his statue. Both the beast and his false prophet were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Their entire army was killed by the sharp sword that came from the mouth of the one riding the white horse. The vulture, all the, all, and the vultures all, be, go, all gorged themselves on the dead bodies. <laughs> That's what's going to happen. Anyone who's watched the movie Terminator, right, you know the main actor, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Remember, there's a popular phrase that he would say, remember, I'll be back, right? And he would say that because it didn't matter how many times a guy got shot, what he went through. I think there's like eight Terminators already, right? He always came back. When Jesus died and he rose from the grave, he stood on Mount Olives just outside Jerusalem, and he told us the disciples, hey, I'm leaving now, but I too will be back. You see, Jesus just prophesies about his second coming, just like he prophesies months before that I'm going to be killed, I'm going to be buried, but three days later I'm going to rise from the grave. You see, when Jesus prophesies, it always comes true, amen? And that's what Jesus is talking about. Our job's to be ready. All right, hold on to your seats because I'm going to describe the most epic time period in the world's history. This event is designated, right, designated the second coming of Jesus Christ. It will be the most jaw-dropping, spectacular event ever seen in this history. The second coming of Jesus will come at the conclusion, though, of another very big event. Okay, you've probably heard about it. It's called the Battle of Armageddon. Another way to say it is we, so we can relate to it, it's going to be World War III. Armageddon is going to be World War III. It's going to make World War I and II look like kid games. All right? This is a big battle. The best I can, I'm going to summarize it for us today. The rapture, we know it can happen at any time. It could happen as I'm speaking right now. That's why we have to be ready. Those that aren't Christians will be left on earth for a period of seven years. I've told you about the called the tribulation. And during this time, God will reestablish his program with Israel. You see, the reason God must reestablish with Israel the Holy Land is because God's revelation to us was to go through his sovereign choice, the nation of Israel. Amen? When you hear people attacking Israel or Jews, they're attacking, remember, they're attacking what's precious to God. We have to honor that. We were grafted in as Gentiles because of the grace of the Father. Because Israel rejected the Messiah, though, God has placed them aside for just a time period, right? The tribulation is going to last that seven years. It'll be the end of our current history when that's over. And Antichrist, though, will, during that time period, it will, if you read the scripture, it will, will arise out of Europe. And there will be a common currency, dollars and way people spent. Everybody will be using the same common currency it could possibly be, possibly be the euro, or it could be a digital currency, maybe the Bitcoin, if you're familiar with the Bitcoin. The leader from Satan, the Antichrist, will arise, and at first, listen, at first he's going to look like a peacemaker. This Antichrist is going to come off like the peacemaker, right? Satan understands, though, what he must do. He must block the second coming of Christ, and the only way he thinks that he can block that which he can't is to try to take out Israel, because that's where Jesus, remember, I'll be back. He's coming back, right? So when we get to this part of the prophecy, listen, Israel is on center stage. Keep in mind, the Antichrist at this point has partnered with Israel, right? Remember, he, he's everybody's friend right now, even Israel's. It's summarized in da Daniel chapter, chapter 11, though. So this is the second half of the tribulation, the second half, the second three and a half years of the tribulation, right, which will set in motion the Armageddon. This is about the Antichrist, because what happened is when he partnered, when he partners with Israel, right, the other world leaders, the other nations, they don't like that, and they're going to attack the Antichrist who's now positioned over here with Israel, right? You're going to see how the Antichrist is doing this on purpose. Let's read Daniel chapter 11. Then at the time of the end, the king of the south will attack the king of the north. The king of the north will storm out with chariots, 
charioteers, and a vast navy. He will invade various lands and sweep through them like a flood. He will enter the glorious land of Israel, and many nations will fall, but Moab, Edom, and the best part of Ammon will escape. He will conquer many countries, many countries, and even Egypt will not escape. He will gain control over the gold, silver, and treasures of Egypt, and the Libyans and Ethiopians will be his servants. But the news from the east and the north will alarm him, and he will set out in great anger to destroy, to destroy and obliterate many. So God is speaking right now about the reaction of other countries to the Antichrist. Remember I told the Antichrist started off as this deceptive worldwide peacemaker, but now he's shifted over here to side with Israel. They don't like it, but just like this Antichrist, just like Hitler, remember Hitler was all about Europe and then it became about the world. This Antichrist is all about Europe and then it becomes about the world and the, the other nations. They don't want a world leader. Right, So this negativity is starting to shift towards this Antichrist who's positioned with Israel. Stay with me. The king of the north who will be influenced heavily by Russia will attack the Antichrist. So you should not be surprised today, guys, when you read about how um, Russia has come to the aid of Syria, joining Iran against Israel. There will also be a re reaction from the king of the south. That's Egypt in the Islamic tendency, which is also against Israel. Many believe that the Antichrist will be Muslim. They will come against Israel and the Antichrist, and the Antichrist, according to Scripture, will defeat them, causing another army to come to play, the army from the east. Many people assume it's China because they have the leading military at this time, but it's going to have to grow tremendously. One of the ways we think it will grow is other small countries will join China. Remember, this great nation coming from the east against the Antichrist. So you have all this happening, all this stuff's going on in one location, right? The Middle East. And then we take a look at Revelation chapter 16, verse 13 through 16. God says this, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gather them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. So Armageddon is this huge battlefield area where these armies are initially coming up against the Antichrist. And maybe you're thinking, well, hey, well, where's God in all this? All this stuff going on, where's God in all this? Well, that's actually a good question. And we see where God is in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 2. Here's God speaking about this through a prophet. For I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the houses, the houses rifled, the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people should not be cut off from the city. So let me explain. All these nations are coming together in the Middle East because Satan has to get rid of Israel and he's developed a plan. His last hope is to take out Israel. But you see, do you see what God just did in Scripture in Zechariah? He is bringing the nations together. Satan thinks he's in control, but really God's controlling Satan to accomplish his will. See, God is allowing the devil at times to be the devil, right? So God's will will be accomplished. I will say this, the devil's not his devil, the devil's God's devil. Sometimes we give the devil too much authority, even though God says we have all authority because we have the Holy Spirit in us, amen? We have all authority because God has all authority, what Scripture says. So God is using the rebellion of a Satan, of Satan to accomplish his purposes. So now the whole world is centered on um, the Middle East. And when this takes place, we're going to see that uh, all those left on earth will be broadcasting it. Remember, this is during the tribulation. So anyone that's left here during that time period, they don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. So everybody here, they're going to broadcast this big event. So go ahead and turn to CNN. Most of those broadcasters will be... I'll go to the next thing. Here we go. Remember, the United States was born out of Europe. So we can't be shocked when the U.S. sides there. You think about this. The military power in Europe is NATO. Who funds NATO? U.S. We're a big funder, the biggest funder to NATO. So it's natural when all this stuff starts to take place, the U.S. will be siding with Europe. Okay, so That's where the U.S. will be. So now you have the whole world, it's a, the whole world's focus on Israel initially coming against the Antichrist. 
But in the middle of the, or, and towards the end of the tribulation, the Antichrist is going to break his agreement with Israel. The Antichrist, right, who now has everyone rising up against Israel is going to flip the script. What's going to happen? Think about this. How sneaky is the devil? He's got everybody focused on him. He's positioned as buddies with Israel, right, God's chosen people. Everybody's trying to take out the Antichrist because they don't want a world power during this time period. And then he's going to flip the script and he's going to join them. Isn't that just like the devil? Now they're all coming against this very small country. You know, when you go to the movies, this just sets the stage for what? The second coming of Jesus is which I'm about to shift gears and talk about, right? This is setting the stage. You know, when you go to the movies and it gets dark right before the main attraction, right? It gets, it gets darker, 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 and pretty soon it's dark. And what's that telling us as moviegoers? The main show is about to start, right? It's about to be showtime. And then we turn to Matthew chapter 24, verse 29. This is showtime. This is the real Lion King. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And they will send his angels and he will send his angels with, with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So let me, I want to descri- break this down just a little bit. Let me describe what's about to happen as these battles are being fought, okay? First between the Antichrist and now shifting towards Israel, right? right? The, this World War III stuff's happening all around. The Bible says this, every eye is going to shift because it's going to go black, and everybody's attention is going to be on the Son of God coming. So you got all this stuff, all this stuff happening, and then everybody is going to see what about to happen. Look at Revelations 1, verse 7. Look, he comes with the clouds of heaven, and everyone will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the nations of the world will mourn for him. Yes, amen. We also read that Jesus came on a white horse. Do you know why he came on a white horse? You see, back in, Roman, back in biblical times, the Roman officer when the battle was about over and he knew he was going to win, he'd go get on his white horse because white horse was a signal of victory. Here comes Jesus. He's riding into victory, sitting on a white horse. And then we see in, in uh, chapter 19, verse 12, his eyes were like flames of fire and on his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. Listen, flames of fire. This, me, this, is, not jeek, this is not meek and mild Jesus. Right? This isn't Jesus, I'm coming back so you can take my life again. This is Jesus coming back to take life. He's taking life to anyone that did not surrender their life to him. The Bible says you're either for me or against me. There's no gray area. I'm a good person. You're against God. You can't be good enough to get into heaven. God says no one comes to the Father except through Jesus. Remember the blood of Jesus on the cross for us? Aren't you thankful that you don't have to earn your way to heaven? Because ain't nobody going to heaven if it was up to us earning it, right? So we all have a choice. And right now we're in the age of grace and we have cousins and friends and neighbors and work people that we work with, people in our area of influence that don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. And right now I hope you're getting what I'm getting to you is that we have to be urgent. We have to feel the urgency of what Jesus is saying in scripture that people need to know about him so they don't get stuck on this side. That's not his desire. He's making, he's building a giant mansion with many rooms. And I hope there's no rooms that are empty. But we have a part to play in that. You see, Jesus is not coming back before this to talk about himself. He's filled us with the Holy Spirit to empower us to talk about him. When he comes back, it's not going to be pretty for non-Christians. It's not his option A. It's, It's really option B or C. It's not what he wants, but he's given people plenty of time. There's two ways that you can relate to Jesus right now. You can relate to Jesus on the cross as the Savior, or you can relate to Jesus on the throne where he's the judge. Well, here comes Judge Jesus. You know how every parent has two sides to them? You've got the lovey-dovey, kissy side, huggy, right, parents? And then you've got the look in your eye as you look to your child and you say, the child knows they've messed up and you better stop. Scripture said that Jesus' eyes were like flames of fire. Here comes a look. At this point, Jesus is coming back as judge. 
He's going to judge all the ones that have rejected him. And when he comes, it says in verse 13, it says, He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. The armies of heaven, dressed in the finest of pure white linen, followed him on white horses. So here's where you and I get to come in. Right? Here's where you and I, we get a white horse. Remember, we've already been taken with him. In the rapture, you're taken. In the second coming of Christ, you're coming back with him. And I was talking to one of our elders, and he goes, Terry, do you? it said they, they came from heaven, so you got to think about this. I wonder if the horses had wings, how they get there, right? We don't have every detail, but just interesting. So the world is, is they're all conversed right now on this Antichrist. Antichrist has flipped sides against Israel, right? Here comes Jesus coming back. And can you picture this? Here comes Jesus, the second coming. All the saints are behind him on horses. Here we are with Jesus, right? And where does he come? He comes back to his original spot. He's returning, scripture says, to Mount Olives. Remember, I'll be back. He predicted it. It's going to happen. Here he comes. Verse four, verse 4 says this. When his feet hit the ground, think about it. In scripture, it says when his feet hit the ground, it split the mountain in two. That's the power of God, splitting a mountain in two. And he said, here comes the vultures, because it's about to be mealtime. Because out of Jesus' mouth, the Bible says he will speak the word and it will slay nations. So this is not going to be a long battle, right? This is not going to be a long battle. This is going to be a real short battle. All those that have rejected him will be slaughtered. As we continue in verse 20, it says, Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. So Jesus will defeat men. He's going to defeat the Antichrist. He's going to defeat the false prophet, right? And then he's going to cast him into the lake of fire. And then he's going to deal with Satan in just a little bit. I know this is a whole lot of stuff, but we just got to get this. I know this is a whole lot, talking about all the different kings and how they, but you got to get a picture. Just because we don't understand every little detail at times doesn't mean we shy away from Scripture, yet sometimes we all can do that, amen? God is bringing us back to the truth today. He will come back as the King of kings and the Lord of lords is what Scripture says. He's described in the Bible as faithful and true. And when he comes back, he rules with an iron rod. Listen, based off, this this is important for us right now. Listen, based off your life now will determine your position later. If you're a faithful follower of Jesus Christ, you will be highly positioned. If you are an unfaithful follower of Christ, you're going to be a street sweeper. You're going to be sweeping the streets in heaven. You'll be singing songs, but you'll be a street sweeper. You'll be assigned a role based off your faithfulness now. How faithful and dedicated a person lives their life on earth will determine your role in heaven. Let me show you this in Scripture. Look at Matthew 25, verse 21. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. And we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. What spiritual stock markets are you investing in right now? Think about that. What spiritual stock markets are you investing in right now? Serving, giving, loving, forgiving, helping the poor, doing all those things when you do those things, you represent Jesus. You're building stock in heaven. Your Bible says storing up treasure, right? Storing up treasure. So how does all this affect us right now? Well, here's the deal. You're still here on earth, so God still has a purpose for you. And we still know we have the little God of the world. That's a little Satan. He's got a purpose. He's attempting to try to keep um, Israel from surviving, right? He's going to try to take out Israel out, right? And then we see in John 1, 4, 4, sometimes you might feel a little overwhelmed, You think the battle's just a a little too much. Look at what God says about us. But you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people because a spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. Amen? That means Satan right now is on a leash. He's on a leash. When you have a dog on a leash, it can go somewhere, but only as far as that leash will allow it. And during the tribulation, God is going to extend Satan's leash. Right? In tribulation, he'll have a little extension, but he's still on a leash because he's still a dog and God's still God. 
What can Satan do to us right now? He can lie. Satan can whisper lies to us and he can make us think you'll never have victory in this area. He loves for us to come in agreement with that. What happens after that? When, you, when you're afraid, fear sets in. He's reminding us today you have all authority. You're going to win in the end. Satan's on a leash. He can only do so much to God's kids. We have to live our life from a place of victory, not from a place of getting pushed back. Amen? Sometimes as Christians, you just got to stick your foot in the sand and say no more. No more. No more sliding back. Today, I'm determined. Today, I'm sticking my foot in the anchor of God is going to establish me where I'm at. I'm not getting pushed around no more. I'm going to have victory in my life. That's good news for you. If you're in a battle right now, this is good news for you. Don't let this word fly by you. Well, that's for someone else. No, if you're in a battle, good news for you is you win. Because greater is he that is in you than the little G in this world. The devil at his very best is still God's devil. God has all authority over all things and everybody. Amen? You know, I'm wearing a watch right now and it says 1022. I don't know how this thing really works. There's a lot of moving parts inside this watch. I don't completely understand it, right? I know I have a job to do. Every night I got to charge this thing up so I can see the time in the morning when I turn it on, amen? I don't have to understand how every little detail works other than I've got a part to do so I can see the time. The whole lot of, there's a whole lot of details about the end times right here. And I'm not professing to be a theologian. I'll just spend a little time with Jesus so I can preach a basic word to us. You don't have to understand every little detail to know what God is saying in this message today. You just have to understand. He says, be ready. Are you ready? The only thing I've done over the last two weeks is give you a little summary that it's time. And the time is near. Tick tock. I believe God is saying to us in this series. The reason you must take prophecy serious is because God has already seen the future. He's come back to, to tell us about the future, to warn us about the future. And the word that God gave this Terry and also gave Terry Swisher this morning was the word urgency. That's been on my heart this week, preparing urgency. You see, God wants us to have an urgency to understand that he's returning soon. Those things in our life that we think are important, that are distractors in our life, they're not that big of a deal. Keep them in the right lane. Let us stay focused as a, as a people. Focus on Jesus Christ and what he's doing in our lives. The main thing is the main thing because it's about to be showtime. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your promises. Lord, that you promise that you're right now, you're building a mansion with many rooms to gather us to you. And when we come back with you on that glorious day of your second coming, Father, Lord, there's already a victory established for us. Father, we pray right now that you'd give us an urgency to speak with boldness to anyone that doesn't know you right now. Maybe there's people out there that we've talked to many times. I'm just asking you, Father Lord, to fill us with your power, your boldness, with your Holy Spirit, that we will profess the, that Jesus Christ is Lord of Lords and Kings of Kings, and that they could have a personal relationship with you right now. God us to be more concerned about people than our own reputation. More concerned about people than our business. More concerned about what people, where their salvation is or where they're going, heaven or hell, than what we think that if they're going to be my friend. Give us that burden, Lord. That urgency to understand what you're doing these last two weeks. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, I want to say don't wait another day. You have no idea when Jesus is returning. He can return before I dismiss. If you don't know Jesus Christ like that, listen, Going to church, you don't know him. You could have 20 Bibles, don't mean you know him. You know about him. The Bible says when you confess with your mouth that he is Lord, and you've made him the Lord of your life, that means he's the boss. If he's not the boss, and he's not your, I want to say you're not saved. Is he the boss of your life? If you've never made him the boss of your life and said, I surrender to him today, no more playing around. I'm going to just ask you, would you raise your hand and say, today be the day, Pastor. Anyone today that want a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, just slip your hand up. Let today be the day. Do not wait another second. Anyone today? I see a hand right up here. Amen. Amen. Let's give God play. Anyone else? If you're online, just respond online. Maybe you're here today and you have a personal relationship with Jesus.
but you've drifted away from the Lord. And right now the Holy Spirit's convicting you and he's calling you back home. He doesn't want a distant relationship with you. He wants an intimate, close relationship with you. And if that's you today and you say, I'm going to recommit my life to Christ today, I'm recommitting. I played games, but I'm no more playing games. I'm back in it with Jesus. If that's you, slip your hand up. You want to recommit your life to Christ today. I see a hand right there, another hand back there. Anyone else? Anyone else? Amen. All right, here's what we're going to do. Families, we pray together. We're going to celebrate what will happen. Just, just repeat after me as family. It's okay for families to pray together. That's normal. Just repeat after me as we, we go along with these decisions, these important decisions. Dear Heavenly Father, Dear Heavenly Father forgive me for my sins. Forgive me my sins. Make me new. Make me new. I believe you died on the cross. I believe you died on the cross. And you rose from the grave. You rose from the to grave. give me life. To give me life. Take my life. Take my life. It is yours. It's yours. In your name we pray. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's give God a clap of praise. God is so good. If you raise your hand, we have a gift for you in the lobby. Make sure you grab that uh, by the Welcome Center and grab that gift. We're super excited for you. Even visit with myself, Pastor Tanya, Pastor Garrett, one of the other leaders here, and uh, let us talk, visit, pray with you. We're super excited. Hey, we're going to stand back up in just a second. We're going to worship God one more time. Let's worship our way out today. Let's give all God all glory and praise. Amen.